chapter 7. We're going to uh, look at verses 7 through 12. It's really moving along here. And the title of this is, Is the Law Sin? Is the Law Sin? You know, after Jesus uh, taught, the, taught the crowds there that uh, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. A young man, and some, in some of the accounts, they call him the rich young ruler, uh, found his way to Jesus. And uh, Jesus was on his way out, actually. And, and we pick it up in Mark 10, verse 17, if you want to turn there. Uh, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. You picture it in your mind. Jesus is just starting to walk. He's headed off to do the next thing. And this young man, probably moved by what he was hearing in Jesus, and convicted deeply, chased him down and, and got down on his knees before him. This is a rich man. And he's bowing before Jesus. And he says to him, Good means benevolent or profitable. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do to inherit eternal life? You see, it was a firm Jewish belief that based on the Old Testament teachings, that the man who kept the law would live. So just Jesus began there. In Deuteronomy 30, Verse 15, it says, See, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in His ways and to keep His commands, decrees and laws. Then you will live and increase, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. So this young man, in his mind, is thinking, okay, if I keep the commands, then I'm going to live. And that's where he's looking. He's looking for life here. What must I do to inherit eternal life? But evidently, there was something missing. There was something that he wasn't getting a hold of because he didn't feel alive. Something was missing. I, what do I need to do? I, I'm doing all these things, but what do I need to do to really have life? Well, Jesus immediately kind of sets him on his heels. He says, why do you call me good? Oh, I'm trying to be nice to you, you know. I'm trying to say you're a good man. I see the goodness in you. And Jesus answered, he said, no one's good except God alone. Okay. So it's not about my goodness. It's about God. Okay. You know the commandments, Jesus said to him. Do not murder. Okay, and he's checking them off in his mind. Okay, I didn't murder anybody. Uh, do not commit adultery. No, I've done that. Do not steal. No, I don't steal. Do not give false testimony. No, I haven't done that. Do not keep, do not defraud. So, one place in, in the three uh, accounts that this is put in there. Is it part of the covenant or is it part of the commandments? Do not defraud? No, it's not specifically written that way. But defrauding <coughs> is to keep back by fraud, to hold for yourself something. Okay? Honor your father and mother. He checks that off. Yeah. Teacher, he declared, all these I've kept since, my, uh, since I was a boy. And, you know, this man, he's pretty confident that he had done everything he was supposed to do. He, he was checking them off. Yeah, 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 okay. I've kept all these commands that Jesus said. And he's probably thinking of his, his youth as being from age 13 when he became a son of the commandment at his bar mitzvah. He became personally responsible to keep the commands at this young age. The idea that the law requires an inner, an inner obedience rather than just an external obedience, I think eluded him. Because he was checking them off. Mm -hmm. 
And what, he, what escaped him was, and I think that's why Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? Is that no man could completely comply with God's requirements. Only God can. Only God can comply with God's requirements. Well, this poor young man, you know, he's getting, his, he's getting an earful right now. and Lots of things. He's getting fed with a fire hose mm -hmm. right now. And he doesn't even know it. But this is what he knows. Jesus looked at him and loved him. He loved him. Somehow, love was expressed to this young man. Maybe he reached down and just picked him up and said, come on, get up. Put his arm around him. And he says, you know, son, there's just one thing you lack. Oh, good, he's going to tell me what the, where the hole is. What, what do I need? There's just one thing you lack. What's that? He said, just, it's simple. Just go sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and you'll have treasures in heaven. Then come and follow me. And at that, the man's face fell. And he went away sad. Because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his word, but Jesus said again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, then who can be saved? If a rich man can't be saved, then who can be saved? If a person that's kept the commandments can't be saved, who can be saved? Well, Jesus' you know, words reflect their Jewish background, where they place great emphasis on the privileged position of the rich. Because to be wealthy was an absolute evidence of having the blessings of God. But Jesus saw how wealth could hinder one from putting his trust and dependence in God. I got money. I don't need God. He didn't own his riches. His riches owned him. There's nothing wrong with being rich as long as it doesn't own you. God is the only one who is good for he is consistent with his own holy nature. He has defined goodness with the law. But we don't discover how really good he is until we come to the end of our own efforts in keeping the law and humbly trust his goodness expressed not in the commands but in the person of his son Jesus. Jesus goes on to say, verse 27, Jesus looked at them and said, With man it is impossible, but with God all things are possible with God. Peter said to him, probably thinking, if I was Peter, I would have thought, Oh, am I supposed to live in poverty then? Am I supposed to just, you know, just sit around and wish I had something to eat? Wish I had some place to live? Wish I had some family? Am I just... What am I supposed to do? Peter said to him, Hey, Jesus, we've left everything to follow you. I tell you the truth, Jesus said, replied, no one has left home or brothers or sisters or mothers or fathers or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail uh, and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children and fields and with them persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last birth. When you give your heart to Christ, you may think, because maybe your family isn't, aren't believers, and 
at the point you give your heart to Christ, there's actually a, a, a division. There's a brokenness in the relationship because it just is. Because your values all of a sudden are different from, from the people that you care about. Of course, you're stepping away from them. And these disciples have stepped away from their homes, away from their fields, away from their work, everything to follow Jesus. And Jesus said, hey, you're going to have more now and later if you come and follow me now. Well, how does that work out? <clears throat> who's my brother and who's my sister? Who's my mom and who's my dad? All of us. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's anybody old enough in here to be my my mom and dad. I feel, I feel that old. You feel that old? <laughs> <laughs> but you at least are my brothers and sisters. Well, what about homes and fields? If you understand unity and what God's calling us to as his, as his church, if you understand what he's calling us to in unity, you don't own your stuff. God owns it. He's got cattle on a thousand hills. He's got, a, yeah, and a couple of donkeys and, yeah, and some rattlesnakes. So, you know, he's got the whole package there, and he owns it all, and he gives us stewardship over his stuff. So when you think you own something, you don't. Know, it's God's. He just says, you know, I'm going to trust you with a little bit of stuff over here, and I hope that you aren't owned by it. Because the whole idea there for the rich young ruler was, Somehow, he was coveting what he had. See? So he didn't keep them all. What's that? He didn't keep all the covenant. The he laws. didn't keep the whole covenant, did he? Because it's impossible to do. It's impossible. We have to wonder if the rich young ruler, as he was walking away, heard Jesus' words. And we have to hope that he did. And then he went, oh, I get it now. I get it now. How many times have we walked away just before the answer is given? You know, Lord, I'm going through all this stuff. You know, And then we walk away. And Jesus, I was just about to tell you. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, anyway. He gives us some things to, to be stewards over. And, and because of the unity we have in Christ, we all own it. You know, you might say, God owns it. And because we're in covenant with Him and we're in unity with Him, we kind of all own it. So we all have lots of homes and lots of fields because we've got lots of brothers and sisters who have homes and fields, okay? That's, that's, that's it. Boy, that's not very American. <laughs> it's not very capitalistic. But that's God's heart. So we get stewardship over things, and when the opportunity comes and he wants us to share something with somebody, we pray about it and say, Lord, you made me a steward over this thing. Do you want me to share it with them? And you pray, and he says yes or no, or gives an alternative to it. Some sort. <coughs> but anyway, so the point of this is what we can never do for ourselves, God does for us. For he is a great doer of the impossible. Amen? Okay, now what's that got to do with Romans 7? Because that's where we're headed this morning. Paul has been ripping the law. Just ripping the law in chapter 7. He's accused the law of having the effect of sin and death. In verse 4 of chapter 7, he says uh, that in order to bear fruit to God, one has to die to the law. In verse 5, he says that the law, that the law far from defeating sin, arouses sin and bears fruit to death. In verse 6, he says that one has to die to the law in order to live under the new paradigm of the Spirit instead of the old paradigm of the written code. The law keeps people from experiencing the new life of the Spirit. He's ripping the law. <clears throat> For someone who's seeking to be free from sin, the good news is that we are freed from the effects of the law when we die to it in Christ and live instead under the law of Christ and the administration of the Holy Spirit. So Paul 
you know, having ripped into the law, and his audience is probably thinking exactly what he's going to address. And, and the next logical question that he's going to address is, what should we say then? Verse 12, 7. Is the law sin? If it's, if, if, if it's so bad, is it sin? Is it a really an evil thing? Certainly not, he says. I indeed would not have known what sin was except through the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was. And that's what the rich young ruler was it dealing with. And it's interesting because Paul uses coveting the way a couple other people do to summarize all the commandments. Believe it or not. Hmm. Think it through sometime. When you have some time, think through how all the other uh, commandments are summed up in covenant. Anyway, little little exercise there. Hmm. <clears throat> Um, for I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, do not covet. You know, you're driving down the road and you're going 55 miles an hour, all of a sudden you see a speed sign that says 45. <clears throat> I didn't know I was sinning until the sign popped up. The law is not sin in itself, but the effects of the law are sin and spiritual death. First of all, the law makes me aware of sin. Until we're aware of the law against something, we're unaware of it being wrong. Paul personally and experientially came to understand and perceive what sin was when he became aware of the law, probably at his young age of 13. He became a son of the commandment. He came, became responsible to keep them. Because in Paul's Hebrew mind, he has an intimate connectedness to, with, uh, to his people. The personal pronoun here, I, you know, he uses the word I there, could also include in a broader sense, Israel. Not just me personally as a personal pronoun, but including all of Israel, because he was, in his mind, he's so much a part of that that I is all of us. I like that. You see, God chose Israel all over, over all other peoples to be his people his inheritance. He gave them their own land. He constantly demonstrates his power on their behalf. He showers them with blessings. And then he asks them to obey the law he gave them. <laughs> Once God gave Israel the law through Moses that was meant to give them life, as we just read in Deuteronomy, it was meant to give them life because of an internal sin defect in Israel and Paul, and you, and me, they found it impossible to keep the law. Couldn't do it. It's impossible. They hardened their hearts. They rebelled. They turned away. They ignored his grace. But after long, and even after long endurance in, you know, with these wayward uh, Israelites, God sent them into exile in foreign lands. But he also promised a new arrangement that will enable them to obey him, not from the outside, but from the inside out. A new heart that responds with life to his goodness, his grace, his love. New heart. The law against coveting is a law against, well, let's just read it. Exodus 20, verse 17. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his, or nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. So the law against coveting, what I don't have, and desiring what I don't have, and especially what others have, is sometimes used to summarize that whole fifth commandment, as I said. The opposite of coveting is appreciating, appreciating what we do have and being willing to give it to others when necessary. Coveting is all about me. I've got to keep it for myself. The opposite of that is being willing to share it with others. And that's where the rich young ruler ran into a snake. Coveting was at the heart of Adam's sin 
that plunged mankind, all mankind into sin. Remember back in Genesis 2, it says, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in that day you shall eat, you shall surely die. What was their response? Where is the tree? Where is the tree? <laughs> Suddenly, something was happening. They wanted something that wasn't theirs. <coughs> Coveting. Well, the serpent picked up on this real well, didn't he? Chapter 3 of Genesis. And he says, Eh, you shall shut. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you will not surely die. For God knows that if they eat of it, your eyes will be open. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. So who wouldn't be, want to be like God, right? Well, who wouldn't want to know it's good and evil? So when the tree, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable, and there's that Desire. key word in coveting, desire. Mm -hmm. A tree desirable to make one wise. She took of its fruit name, and she also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. That's proof positive that Adam didn't know how to cook. <laughs> then, the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Amazing. Now let's start the great cover-up right from there. So covetousness is seen as Israel's discontentment with God's provision in the wilderness also. Remember when they were in the wilderness? And they were so happy with what God was providing for them, weren't they? Mm -mm. <laughs> they grumbled against Moses. Numbers 21.5 And the people spoke against Moses, against God, and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. Wait a minute, wait a minute. There's no food? There's no water? Good grief. Anyway, you wake up every morning and there's food on the ground. And there's water coming out of rocks. What do you mean there's no food? There's no water. Well, we're just sick of this old bread. Man, this stuff. The what? That's what literally man means. What? <laughs> what? What is that? So the opposite of covetousness is, what do you think? What do you think? What's the opposite of covetousness? Generosity. Starts with a C. I'm going to... Contentment. 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 Uh, she read my notes. Oh. <laughs> covetousness. Contentment. And we picked that up in 1 Timothy 6. 6 through 10. Now godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry... Nothing out. <laughs> and having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. But those who desire, there's that word again, to be rich, rich and ruler, fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. If I want money, what am I willing to do for it? Am I willing to break the commandment about lying? Stealing? Putting something else before God? Not obeying my parents? Why do you keep looking at me? I <laughs> <laughs> no! No, no, not me! You know, desire to be rich. For the love of money, the love of money, this out of bounds desire for it, is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced them through with many sorrows. Listen. God wants to bless us. What our job is, is to be a faithful steward over what he gives us. A faithful steward. And he might add some, and he may take some away. You know what? I still got to be faithful with whatever you have. Second thing about what Paul's saying about the law is that the law aggravates sin. 
It just aggravates it. It stirs it up. Not only does the law make you aware of sin, it makes me a worse sinner. Uh, but that's not what it was supposed to do. It was supposed to conform us to God, godliness. But it was external. Verse 8 of chapter 7 there. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of covetous desire. For apart from the law, sin is dead. Okay, here's, a, here's something that we're going to camp on a little bit. But sin. He gives it its own life, its own personality, its own entity. Sin. Okay? But sin. It's like, the law is like the door of a vault. You know, you've got valuables inside, you got, but you have a door on it because it's the only entry point for the owner. But it's also the entry point for the robber. Okay? So the commandment is the entry point of every covetous desire. It was designed to keep the robber out, but the very fact that there's a door gives the robber who seizes the opportunity the opportunity to steal. The law was designed to give life, but it has the effect of being the entry point for sin and every kind of every kind of sin and ultimately death. Paul goes on to say in verse 9, Once I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. If Paul is speaking personally, he may be referring again to his bar mitzvah at 13. Before that, it was his parents' responsibility, not his. After bar mitzvah, ah, now it's on me. I'm a son of the commandment. Personally, responsible to God. If Paul is speaking corporately of all Israel, he's referring to Israel's life before and then after the Mosaic Law was given. Israel was in existence before the Mosaic Law was given. Goes clear back to who? Abraham. Okay. Abraham is the patriarch of all Israel. And he's our patriarch too. Uh, so what's Paul's conclusion? Verse 10. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. For sin, and again, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, deceived me. Sin deceived me. And through the commandment, put me to death. Sin deceived me and put me to death. So then the law is holy. And the commandment is holy, righteous, and good. That's his conclusion. Well, it's intended to bring life if obeyed had the effect of bringing death because people were and are incapable of keeping it. Paul treats sin as an entity. Uh, that it is in us, but it is not us. I got it. This is an important point. As believers, you have a brand new life. Brand new existence. But there's this thing inside of you that you inherited from Adam. This virus. It's the third factor. <clears throat> Often we're, we're kind of bilateral in our thinking. It's either this or this. I must have goofed up or the law is bad. Actually, there's a third factor. The factor of sin. It's infected me. It's killing me. I need to be healed. The law reveals the infection. Makes us aware of the deficiency of our infection, of the virus that's in us. But it has no ability to cure the problem. Okay, when my hearing went out, the doctor says, well, I want to do an MRI. I want to do a brain scan and see if there's a tumor on that little nerve in there. So I did a brain scan. They found nothing. <laughs> 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 it's 
But if they had found something, the MRI wouldn't have cured it. It just revealed it. Are you tracking with me? Okay. You know, doctors are there with the intent of saving lives, but too often the effect of their procedures bring death. And here's some statistics for you. The number of physicians in the U.S. is 700,000. Accidental deaths caused by physicians per year are 120,000. Accidental deaths by physicians is then 0.171. And these are statistics courtesy of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Now think about this. Gun owners, the number of guns owned in the USA are 80 million. The number of accidental gun deaths per year, all age groups, is 1,500. The number of accidental deaths per gun owner is zero. 000188. Statistics courtesy of the FBI. So statistically, doctors are approximately 9,000 times more dangerous than gun owners. <laughs> <laughs> so then remember, guns don't kill people, doctors do. <laughs> Here's the fact, not everyone has a gun, but almost everyone has at least one doctor. And uh, that means that you're over 9,000 times more likely to be killed by a doctor than by a gun owner. So we're supposed to really alert our, our friends to this, this truth. And you know what we should do? We should ban doctors before this gets completely out of hand. <laughs> and in these statistics I got, they mentioned that out of concern for, pub for the public at large, we withheld the statistics on lawyers for fear the shock would cause people to panic and seek medical attention. <laughs> <laughs> and whoever sent that to me, thank you very much. It was very appropriate. It's very cute. Anyway. So sin is the enemy, not the law, and not you. You're not the enemy in this equation, and neither is the law. The law is not the enemy. In the same way God is love, love is not God. So then the law leads to sin, but the law is not sin. Secondly, the law is good and holy. It is a revelation of God's holiness and character, His criteria for God-pleasing righteousness. And thirdly, it's not our enemy because the law reveals our inability and the desperate need to meet God's criteria that leads us to Christ. I couldn't keep the law, the young ruler realized in that moment. And we hope that he heard Jesus say, but I can. You are not the enemy. The law is not the enemy, and you are not the enemy. And we ought to condemn ourselves for what we do in the flesh, laying all the blame at our feet. And I'm not saying we should excuse our evil behavior. But I am saying that we should be aware of the third factor and not condemn ourselves, but rather put our absolute faith in the only one who's able to deliver us from sin, to cure sin. Amen. Don't. Well, we'll get into this when we get to chapter 8. But I had to set the stage for the rest of chapter 7. Because you see, the real enemy is not Paul. And the real enemy is not the law. The real enemy is sin. Chapter 8. I'm going to read a little bit of it, starting verse 3. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit, the new paradigm for relationship with God. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. How can I get more money? How can I covet things? You know, what do I have to do to get it? But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit, Lord, what do you want me to do? When you wake up in the morning, do you ask the Lord, Lord, thanks for the day. This is your day. What do you want me to do? Just start the day that way. You'd be surprised what God does. Put it in His hands. So what application can we get out of this? If, uh, oh, I should say, obedience to the law could save you if you could keep it.
but because of the third factor of sin in our lives, it's powerless to do so. So what do we do with the law? The law comes from God's own heart. It bears His marks of goodness, holiness, and righteousness, and reveals His divine character to us. Because Paul finds himself at a hinge point in history between the paradigm of the law and the paradigm of the Spirit, his focus is on the law is generally negative. Because he's seeing this, this new dynamic happening here. So he's kind of negative toward the law and positive toward this spirit, this walk, the spirit law. We may not be under the law's direct authority anymore, but to meditate on his law has value and benefit. We don't throw out the Old Testament when we become a Christian. It's a revelation of God's holiness and His character. Um, it has benefit as a means of better appreciation of just who our God is and what He values. Thirdly, it's a benefit as a means of understanding our own place in the plan that God unfolds in Scripture. And finally, it, uh, it helps us to more fully appreciate His grace and love in accomplishing for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. Oh my goodness, God's love is so powerful. And when we experience that personally, existentially, it changes us. It changes us. Law is not the enemy. You're not the enemy. Sin's the enemy. Jesus died on the cross to deal with sin. Amen. And as we've looked, I'm going to add just a little bit here. As we've looked already, once you're a Christian, sin, sin, sin takes a little bit different view in this. That we know from uh, Exodus chapter 33, 34, 33, 36, I think, that the Lord forgives wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Septuagint says He removes wickedness, rebellion, and sin. So, at the cross, <clears throat> Jesus deals with the, the issue of sin. He removes it from us. He removes iniquity, the, that core propensity for evil. He removes lawlessness and rebellion because he writes his laws upon our heart. And he deals with what we call sin missing the best that God has for us. What we do is, what, when we sin as Christians, what we're doing is not living into this brand new life that Christ has given us because of unbelief. All sin has its roots in unbelief. I just don't believe God can deal with this, so I'm going to take it to my own hands. I just don't think God can provide for me, so I'm going to steal, or I'm going to cheat, I'm going to do something. I just don't believe. And you see how that is sin. We get to live into, in complete faith, who we are in Christ. And in that way, over time, and ultimately when we see Jesus again, the complete eradication of sin comes to fruition. Amen. Are you with me? Yes. See, sin is the enemy, not you. And you're going to do a lot better dealing with it. Amen? I hope, Amen. you know, this is wonderful stuff. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for Paul. Lord, and what a man who had such an incredible religious heritage, Lord. Amazing credentials as a Pharisee and a Hebrew of Hebrews, born of the tribe of Benjamin, standing faultless before your law. Lord, and yet he too found an empty hole. He was trying in his own strength to do everything he wanted to do, but it had to bug him that he was murdering people, or at least had a hand in murdering people, against the very command that you've given against it. Lord, it had to bug him. And when you approached him there in Acts 9 on the road to Damascus and revealed yourself to him, he was completely transformed. Completely. He still had some struggles because the residual of that Sin virus was still in him, but he sought for what it was, and he trusted you to deal with it. 
Lord, this morning I pray in this congregation that you would fill us with your spirit, that you would help us to walk in the spirit, that you would give us, that you would help us not to feed that virus with anything. Lord, it's kind of like some cancers. Cancers live on the blood supply, on sugar. And if we cut off that, we cut off their life support. And Lord, that's what we want to do. We just want to cut off anything that feeds sin, and we want to feed the spiritual man. So Lord, help us with that. Help us to wake up more and say, Lord, this is your day. I want to walk in your spirit. I want to do what your plan says, not my plan. Help me to know what it is. Reveal it to me. Open my eyes. Thank you, Father. Please set this congregation free in your, in your love. Set us free, Lord, in our new life in you, that we might radiate, Lord, your grace and your love to this dead, dark, comatose world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Mm -hmm.